Hi, my name is Adrian Jones. Welcome to the SCORE PNC webinar. I'm joined by my colleague, Will Thorne out of London. Together, Will and I run PNC Ventures for SCORE. PNC Ventures has deployed almost 40 million euros of investments across nine different companies in both the US and Europe. And so we wanted to talk about today, what's going on in the world of InsureTech. We're going to talk about that very broadly. Uh, however, the one thing that we'll not go into is the effect of COVID on InsureTech. If you'd like to see a webinar about COVID on InsureTech, I can send you dozens of them. Just send me an email and they will be in your inbox. So without further ado, let's get started. Will, what are you seeing in Europe in terms of InsureTech trends right now, particularly around funding uh, going into 2021 and what are your predictions for 2021? Yeah, well, hi everybody. You know, it, it's it's been interesting because we, uh, we we sort of went through a variety of activities. The world transitioned into COVID, and I realise I'm already breaking the rules, so sorry for that. Uh, but the, there was a, a flurry of investment rounds as companies looked to really establish the runway that they need to get through into mid 2021 and beyond. And after that uh, came to an end, uh, I, I really expected to see us down and deals done, and also potentially a kind of valuation correction. And instead, what we've kind of seen is that valuations have still been very high, um, which is really in line with some of the trends in, in, uh, in the broader European venture market. And SaaS in particular uh, is really highly valued right now, which I think is, is driven by a, an increased take up of new solutions as we all adjust to work from home. And of course, uh, we're all reading about some of the very high public market valuations in, in brand name SaaS businesses. So I think what we're seeing in, in Europe is almost what I would call a, a flight to quality. If you imagine uh, there's almost a, a two-way access uh, between the, the level of proven revenue and then the, the recurring nature of that revenue, if you're a business which has those qualities, you're in uh, hot demand right now. But if you're, if you're struggling for, for traction uh, or if you're trying to raise money on the story, and it's not at the very beginning of your company life cycle, the funding story is, is, is quite difficult. Um, and, you know, in, interested to know whether that's what you've been seeing in the US as well. Yeah, in the US, we're still seeing credible businesses get funded. Um, we're also seeing some businesses that are perhaps not as credible getting funded as well. So we're not seeing what I think a lot of us expected to see, regardless of whether anything had happened earlier this year or not. Uh, we're not seeing this sort of differentiation, uh, flight to quality, uh, reorientation of investment dollars around the winners that we were expecting to see. And so the upshot is, it's still a great time for new companies to raise money. There's a lot of money out there in venture. And I think we're going to continue to see uh, companies get funded. And some of them, perhaps, if they're not starting out in the right spot, will use their funding to pivot and get to the right place. Um, so we're still seeing it, we're still seeing funding, and we're starting to see, I believe, increased uh, potential acquisition activity among some of the incumbent carriers as they have gone through this process, starting with, you know, doing accelerators and incubators and field trips to Silicon Valley, which were all the rage in 2015 and 16, starting to then do venture investing, then doing a whole number of POCs and actual real work. Uh, with InsureTechs, and that's and that combined with realization of some of the inadequacies of the technical environment and desire to grow, desire to find new channels, uh, I believe is going to lead to increasing uh, M&A activity, both among InsureTechs, but also InsureTechs being acquired by incumbents, um, you know, potentially starting now and, and running in through next year and beyond. Yeah, I think that, that's that's very interesting. I think we've just started to see that in Europe, but my sense is that the European market is maybe slightly lagging behind in terms of that, that consolidation uh, of, of companies. I think we've also seen, uh, you know, almost a trend in terms of the, the type of companies that have been attractive in, in getting funding. And that there's definitely some sort of loss of momentum that we're seeing over here in terms of new seed stage personal line startups. Whereas if you're in uh, specialty lines or you have a differentiated way of underwriting in uh, even small business or, or larger commercial insurance, we're, we're seeing more and more money go into those sectors. And again, 
uh, you know, my, my view is that's actually something which the US and the European markets have, have in common. Um, is that the case? Yeah, I think it's a natural evolution. You know, you start out with four or five companies trying to do renters insurance, um, and then you move on to auto and then homeowners. So you start getting increasingly more complicated, then you get into small business, then you start getting into larger businesses and specialties. Uh, I think there is probably more opportunity in those larger business lines and in specialties uh, in excess and surplus in the United States uh, compared to what there was several years ago even. Um, and I think that it is also much easier to get funded there compared to what it was several years ago. Um, so we've talked to some veterans in the industry who, you know, were trying to do this 15 or 20 years ago, and it was just extremely difficult. And that's true for both insurance companies, MGAs, uh, but also SaaS businesses. So that to me, even if you think that InsureTech is a bubble, and even if you think that some of these high flying companies are going to come back down to earth and crash really hard, I think you have to admit that the growth of the funding industry in insurance is going to be a significant change that could have long lasting impacts. And I think that's really good for insurance companies because insurers historically have underinvested in R&D relative to other industries. We've also underinvested in operating efficiencies in other areas of the business. But actually, the fact that we have underinvested is what has led capital markets to putting money into these businesses. And ultimately, if they work and insurers acquire them, that's all good for the industry. So we're not hearing, a, I realize I'm going on a tangent here, but we're not hearing people say uh, insure techs are going to be totally disruptive. You know, that narrative is long dead. Now it's all about the collaboration going forward. Well, you, you, you know, let, let's just dig into that SaaS piece a bit, because I, I guess, you know, you, you and I have um, sat through um, kind of lo lots of different pitches, which all come together, very often focusing on one problem in insurance. And I think one of the, the questions we get asked a lot is how, how do you differentiate between, you know, the 20 solutions which are all looking to solve you know, first notice of loss, predicting the outcome of liability claims? What is what is the process for really understanding what has a, a high impact solution and, and what is uh, less impactful? You know, we spend a lot of time working with our clients at SCORE. Uh, and of course, our clients are most of the world's major insurance companies. Um, so if you're watching this and there is someone in your organization who is like the insure tech person or even a department, uh, get them connected with us because we'd love to look at things together with them, put our heads together and say, okay, let's really look at several different solutions that are in this particular space or solving this particular problem that we have identified as an issue for insurance companies or an issue for us as a reinsurer. Um, and then let's rigorously find out which one is the best. Sometimes, to be honest, uh, it's very hard to do. Uh, and in that case, you can either choose one or you can wait and see who ultimately emerges as the winner and, and adopt that technology. Uh, and I think that, that that latter approach of just kind of wait and see is actually fairly common in insurance. Uh, and to a degree, that is something that we're fighting against to try to say, let's pick one and let's just do it and let's figure this out and figure it out before our competitors do. Well, that's why this is a fun job, right? <laughs> so, Will, um, what are you hearing when you're talking with insurance companies? What are the big concerns right now, and, and what are the solutions they're looking for in InsureTech? You know, I, I think um, there's obviously a, a huge variety in terms of the maturity of uh, companies in, in digital spaces, depending on um, where they're operating and the type of business they're focused on. But there, there's one commonality, which is at this point in time, when we're just uh, maybe transitioning out of a, uh, a challenged or a, a soft market and into um, you know, the, the new world that we're starting to see before us, the, the laser focus has been on solutions which really impact either the top line or impact the, um, the claims handling experience, so the, the bottom line, the, the loss ratio. And it, it's sort of gone through a, a progression. So in the claims space, I think people have started with wanting to um, put their claims processes and the ability of their consumers to do things like self-serve 
uh, in line with the benchmark that was set, uh, and let's give them credit for it, by some of the more prominent insure techs three, four, or five years ago. And we've seen people looking to kind of level up their offering to, to match. But now they're looking to go beyond that. And so the, the number one request that we're seeing is how do we actually understand the value of our claims data? And how can we then actually uh, create an automated process to respond to claims handling rather than simply the first notice of loss? And actually, I, I think that's a, a great example because the, the latest uh, partnership that you've um, kind of worked on for us is exactly in that space. Yeah, absolutely. Claims analytics. And, and I think this started in part with a couple of recognitions. One is that claims is an area that has been underinvested in for a long time. Uh, and two, uh, the social inflation that we're seeing, particularly in the United States, uh, is driving companies to say both, uh, I need to get a better handle on what sort of claims are going to be large claims, but also I need to get a better handle on my loss adjustment expense. Uh, we talked with one large insurance company that spends a billion dollars a year just on outside counsel. And they said anything that we can do to use that spend more effectively, get the right counsel on the right claims or not have counsel at all, as the case may be, uh, is very valuable to them. So we're, we're seeing a lot in claims. I think we're also seeing uh, a lot of core systems work. Um, I'm particularly excited about some of the modern software development companies, um, such as those that can do no-code or low-code uh, software development. Uh, and if you back that all the way up, that can create a much better experience for the consumer on the front end. Um, you combine that with much better data assets, uh, better satellite imagery and property, um, and ultimately, I think that you can create a much better, more robust customer experience than what we've seen uh, in most insurance so far. This doesn't solve all the hard cases, but at least it gets the straight through processing rate up quite substantially. And you know, we, what do you see as the, the untouched space uh, in, uh, let, let's call it analytics and, and modeling? I, th I think we, we've both seen that there's still very often a focus on um, NatCat uh, issues, where of course it's, it's an incredibly important topic and we, we, we really do believe that there's upside. But if we look at other areas, particularly in uh, large commercial and industrial insurance, we just really haven't seen that the same data augmentation and data um, prediction, if you like, that we have in personal lines and starting to come into small business um, we, we haven't really seen it emerge, and definitely for me, it's an area where we, we see demand both for our colleagues in specialty insurance at school, but also for our clients. Yeah, you know, whenever we, uh, or I should say in many cases, when we have talked with uh, startups who are looking at doing something in large commercial, the definitions of large uh, are very different. Um, what we see as large commercial versus what others do. And, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, there's just much less data there. Um, but two, it's a much more niche-focused, specialized uh, sort of business. And so you don't have entrepreneurs walking around Silicon Valley saying, how can I do better loss predictions for the loss of an oil rig, uh, for example? Um, there's probably only a few people in the world that can do that. Um, but if you think about the size of those losses where you're talking billions in individual losses as well as billions a year in actual losses, uh, there is an enormous opportunity there. And I, I would love to find opportunities where you get the sort of, you know, grizzled industry expert who's done it for 30 years, been there and seen it all, partnered with uh, some whiz kid from Silicon Valley who says, I can figure this out better. Um, we haven't seen a lot of that. I, I really hope that we do. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I think if we if we look at the partners that we've um, been been lucky enough to work with, I think the one consistent thing we have is that most of those teams are a combination of that grizzled, uh, experienced in, individual, uh, although they might be a young grizzled person, <laughs> uh, together with um, someone who's uh, super smart when it comes to either um, data or to software development. Are, are you a young grizzled person, Will? <laughs> uh, probably not before this job, but maybe starting to get there now. <laughs> I think grizzled comes after 10 years in insurance. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, Will, uh, you know, a number of companies have organized themselves as uh, either carriers or MGAs. So they're actually producing risk, and that could be either working with or working against 
uh, our client companies, uh, the insurers that are out there. What are you seeing in terms of trends of their ability to get capacity in the marketplace? Um, is it increasing, decreasing? What are you seeing? Uh, you, you know, I think uh, the, the, there's two competing trends which are happening in the, the capacity market. So the, the first is there's definitely been, I think, a, a narrowing of available capacity, particularly in those lines of business where there is a sense that there are already a lot of new players. And you talked about uh, some of them earlier, you know, auto or renters in, in the US, say. Uh, and then simultaneously, I think, in the context of the, the hardening market, um, you know, people have refocused their books a little bit around some of their core business areas. And so there's almost been a flight to um, quality on, on the side of the insurers who now really are looking to only deploy capacity into the best startups from an MGA uh, perspective. And then equally on the other side, there's a sense that the broader insure tech community has realized that one of the critical things if you're setting up an MGA is to have a part partnership that is established for the long term and where there's an alignment of interest which drives a long-term partnership. And we've seen recently, uh, for one reason or another, a few insurtech partnerships come to an end, and the disruption to those businesses is very, very high. So I, I think the, the one piece of advice that certainly I tend to give some of the startups that are out there, whether we work with them or not, is really look to build that collaborative working relationship in the early years, because when uh, you know alternative pressures start to come forward, it's that relationship that pays off and sets you up for the future. Going to your, to your other question around uh, the, the MGA to, to full stack uh, transition, you know, for me, it, it's a fairly simple test and that's, do you have the scale and efficiency that kind of drives a, a profitable outcome as a carrier? And if you don't, it's probably not worth taking on the expenses and the, and the personnel needed to, to run a carrier. Um, but also, what does it unlock in terms of pushing products or pushing new technology to market? Once you get to this point where you start to see that you can actually have a material improvement in the pace of product development and then the pace of improving the outcome both to your capital and to uh, consumers, and you have the scale and efficiency that you need, that for me is the perfect point to transition uh, into a carrier. And there are all sorts of ways to do it. And actually, I, I've been interested to see that really the US is probably leading the way in terms of some of the innovative structures around taking on capital into those carriers, which solve some of the problems that the traditional venture market has, where it can be challenging to get venture returns from a regulated entity. Yeah, one of them is or suddenly back to the future, uh, the reciprocal exchange, which uh, had basically essentially gone away. It was about 7% of US personal lines were organized as reciprocal exchanges. Uh, and then suddenly there have been several of them, probably a half dozen uh, that have been formed just within the last two years uh, as people rediscovered the structure. Um, so it, it's kind of funny because we're finding that, that even with people who are very much dedicated to what's new, part of what they're discovering is in fact what's very old about our business, um, but that perhaps our own business has forgotten about. Um, well, I, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about corporate venture capital. Um, Insurance companies, I think, are actually uh, natural venture capital investors, uh, much more so than many other forms of corporate, because most insurance companies have big uh, insur have big investment arms. Uh, now we invest in AAA quality bonds, um, but a number of these investment offices at a number of insurance companies go far beyond that. They add a lot of Tabasco to their uh, investment portfolio, and that includes investing in venture capital funds. So to me, this the, the sort of investing by insurance companies into young companies in their backyard that they may even be working with uh, seems like a somewhat natural progression um, and a natural expansion of what insurance companies are capable of doing already. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the reasons why companies in the insurance industry make venture capital investments? Well, I think the, the there's really two two ways of bringing um, corporate venture capital to life, and it's all about your core rationale for for playing in this market. And generally speaking, people are either investing for a strategic uh, return or a financial return, or in some kind of hybrid model. And the pure financial plays 
Um, this, as you said, I think fits perfectly within the investment strategy for a uh, small allocation, say, of uh, an insurance company. But for the strategic piece, I think what uh, I see as the huge advantage uh, for insurers is that if you create alignment through an investment, you are far more likely to throw off strategic benefits in terms of new products, new modeling, new analytics, than if you're working in an outsourced commercial relationship. And so I, I think the, the, the core thesis behind a lot of the CVC plays in insurance is ultimately about trying to extract some of this upside and bring it into uh, their companies. But I, I think what is really interesting about um, corporate venture capital in, in insurance is that traditionally the, the venture capital market has had some, some concerns about strategic players uh, playing in, in, in venture capital. And there are some things which are really unique about insurance that solve a lot of those concerns. And the first is that insurance is so often a subscription or a sharing market, particularly in the, in the reinsurance space, that we're all used to working with each other and collaborating. And, and um, you know, although, of course, we're, we're competing in business, we have an excellent working relationship, which is driving towards a positive outcome. And that means that just because someone sees, for instance, a score on a cap table, uh, that doesn't kill the potential of that company to then go and work with any of the other insurers or reinsurers who are interested in them. And I think um, you know, the, the will of Silicon Valley VC has started to understand that. And that, 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 that has meant, for me, the, the conversation has changed a lot from when uh, we first got going in 2016, 2017, which is, you know, why, are, uh, why is your investment not going to damage our company? And now the conversation I see is much more, we're really excited about the role that an insurer can play in developing uh, the product suite for this company. And that's a much better relationship between the three parties of the company, the strategic investor, and then the financial investors. Yeah, uh, I, I think we're seeing that as well uh, in the United States. Um, one of the reasons that I think corporate VC can be very, very interesting in insurance is, number one, they value us being on the cap table, as you mentioned, but number two, that allows us to create our own catalysts. So we can uniquely add value to our own investments in a way that in many other places they can't. So if you look at a typical corporate VC, they're out, you know, investing in a Horizon 2 or Horizon 3 sort of thing, which is actually fairly far off, in order to learn a technology that may or may not ever be relevant to that, to that company. But I think here in insurance, we're actually seeing uh, a number of solutions which are actually fairly close to home, uh, reasonably well developed at this point, and companies saying, you know, if you have two horses going individually, they can only pull so much. But if you put them together, they can actually pull twice the amount that the two can pull individually. And so if, if you align your strategic interest with your financial interest and you, you, you orient them together, you can actually accomplish far more. So one of the things that we've been doing as Scorpion's Ventures is not just investing on our own, but also investing with a number of insurance companies. Um, so we have partnered with, uh, actually on several of our most recent deals, with insurance companies around the world, where again, we look at the investment jointly, we look at the company jointly, we all decide we're in this together, uh, we agree on terms, and again, it's putting all of the best minds together to try to figure something out and make a company work. That's creating your own catalyst, but that's also us as SCORE trying to be as helpful as we can be to our insurance company clients as they try to figure figure out issues in their business. And, and this is one of the ways we do it. So if anyone's watching this and is interested in collaborating with us on uh, that sort of investing, uh, feel free to reach out to either Will or me on LinkedIn or first initial last name at score.com. So there's my commercial. How'd I do? Uh, eight and a half out of 10, which coming from a British person means it was excellent. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I'm aware we, we probably don't have too much uh, time left. So I, I thought perhaps it, it could be nice to finish by maybe talking about one of our, our partnerships and something that you're, you're really excited about. Yeah, you want to go first on that, Will? Sure. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm quite passionate about, both in, in my personal life and also in the role that uh, SCORE is playing, is the increased focus around, um, you know, environmental and, and social um, security. And one of our um, partners, uh, a company in the United States called Energetic Insurance, 
is using insurance in a really innovative way to unlock the financing of new solar developments. And it's been very exciting to watch them develop because in the last uh, month, they've just uh, been able to unlock a new development uh, worth around uh, five or six megawatts, which is really the equivalent, uh, as far as I can tell, and don't criticize me if my statistics are not quite uh, correct, of um, uh, planting around 40 giant uh, sequoias. So just by the application of insurance, transformed by their unique modeling uh, expertise, uh, we've been able to make a, a difference, which is completely aligned with these environmental um, uh, goals that uh, are starting to become incorporated in more and more companies worldwide. So it's a, it's a nice juxtaposition for me of two of the major trends of our time, uh, InsureTech and this um, energy transition. Interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think both of us uh, are driven by our personal passions, uh, both for investing as well as for insurance. Um, you don't often find people have any passion for insurance, uh, but I think that we do. Um, and one of the passions that I had was uh, when I had to buy title insurance for the first time. So title insurance is when you uh, buy or sell a home in the United States, there's no guarantee that you actually own what you think you own. Uh, and so you insure that against possible loss. And the first time I bought a, a, an apartment here in New York and I said, oh my gosh, why do I have to pay this $2,500 for title insurance? I don't need that. Like it's a condominium, it's new construction. There couldn't possibly be any problem with the title. Uh, and you know, I ended up uh, paying for it and um, didn't understand why. So when I was told that there was somebody who was out there innovating in the title insurance space, I said, this is a problem area, we need to fix this. Uh, got connected and uh, you know, now we're almost three years uh, into a relationship where uh, we helped the company to get off the ground. We helped them uh, through a lot of the initial growth. Uh, SCORE has provided the uh, risk capital as well. So SCORE's rating standing behind the company. SCORE also provided a material investment. Companies using, the company is called Skates Title, and they're using artificial intelligence as the main means of underwriting their flagship product, which is an instant title solution. Whereas previously it had taken uh, several uh, days or even weeks uh, in order to get a title commitment. They can do that now, they can also do it much more efficiently and therefore they can do it at a lower price than uh, the incumbents can. So this again was kind of a, a combination of a personal passion of mine, an area of the business I just said, this has to change. And everybody that I talked to said, yeah, this has to change. Um, and actually being able to do something about it. Um, so that, that's been really exciting. Um, I think the other thing that, that I enjoy is uh, just spending time with our clients and talking, talking to them about mm -hmm. what are your issues? Uh, what are you seeing in your business? What are you trying to find solutions for? And then trying to make those connections. Um, so we make, uh, you know, probably every day we're making connections between uh, insurers and startup organizations that are doing something interesting. And several of those have led to uh, actual deals being done and, and people using the solutions. Uh, so I like that as well. Um, you know, if you're from an insurance company and you want to continue this conversation, uh, feel free to ping Will and me again on LinkedIn or ajones at score.com or wthorn at score.com. Uh, we'd be happy to set up a conversation with you and uh, if we need to also bring in some other score experts uh, and we'd be happy to work with you on all things related to InsureTech. Will, anything you'd like to add in conclusion? Uh, no, but I, I would certainly say that uh, I'd all upgrade that pitch review to a 9 out of 10, so it's good to see right. progress even in this short time. <laughs> well, I need to do two more so I can get the 10 out of 10. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us. Hope that you enjoyed this webinar, and please tune in for the next set in the Square webinar series. Thanks a lot.